Hallelujah. Yes, these past few years have been a moving experience. But each move has been better, hasn't it? And if the Lord has another one for you, I think it's going to be so glorious, it's going to be beyond your expectation or imagination. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I enjoyed your songs, your singing. Thank you. Yes, it is. It is His grace, His grace. Where would we be without His grace? I don't even want to think of it. One person said grace simply spells God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Well, I can't think of a better definition than that. But I assure you there's one thing that I never want to get far from, and that's His grace. There have been many times, and the words of that song, whoever wrote that, I want to tell you something, they have learned about the grace of God. They have learned, or they couldn't write it that way. I can't tell you the number of times in, in my life that I have cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, if you'll just give me a little strength, I can believe you for the grace to sustain me. <laughs> That's what he told Paul who cried out to the Lord three times that that thorn in the flesh would be removed from him. How would you, how would you like to be a minister? I mean, we, I, I've read different commentaries about what that means. What was the thorn in the flesh of Paul? My word, why don't you just read the Bible? You'll find out what it is. Everywhere the poor man went, there were riots. <laughs> Can you think of a worse thorn than that? I mean, he gets arrested, his back is laid wide open, five times, 39 stripes like his Lord. Do you have trouble wondering what his thorn was? <laughs> there were religious people that chased him all over the world. There were religious people that took a vow that they would not eat again until they killed him. <laughs> I think they starved to death. <laughs> you know, you've got to watch out about these, these vows you make. I, the first vow I remember making was that I would go on the streets at 18 years old. I just started university. And I would go on the streets every Saturday night and hand out 100 gospel tracts. And I wouldn't leave the streets uh, until I handed out all 100. The first Saturday night, I got three handed out. I broke my vow <laughs> because I found out there was a curfew. I wasn't 21. And so I had to be off the streets by 1030 or be with somebody that was 21. Nobody would go with me. So the second Saturday night, that meant I had 197 tracks to hand out because <laughs> I got to keep my vow. Dad said, never make God a promise. You live by it or you die by it. I don't want to die for 197 tracks, but I thought the math. Dear Lord, if I only get three handed out tonight, by a month and a half, I'll need a wheelbarrow to carry all these tracks. Now, this is not good. <laughs> America... America had the Sabbath laws back then. Now, now, we've changed a little bit since 1961. I'm sorry, now you know how old I am. <laughs> I'm just 39 and holding, don't worry. Hallelujah. I'm going for 120. Praise God. If Jesus waits, maybe it'll take till I'm 120 to really prepare me to be a proper bride. You know what I mean? I really was distressed a couple years ago when I come back down out of Canada into your state, Washington here, turned on the Christian radio station, found out we had just in the Supreme Court passed same-sex marriage. Now, I can talk about this now. You know why? Because our president loosed my tongue. He signed an executive order. <laughs> on the National Day of Prayer. Now, Obama sealed my tongue. I can't tell you the number of cities I went to where they said, whatever you do, don't you say one word about homosexuals or lesbians. 
or it's a $10,000 fine. We have to send the recording to the sheriff. They'll issue a warrant for your arrest. You will be put in jail. My tongue was bound. No, it wasn't. I went on talking about homosexuals and lesbians. But I gave testimonies how they, I led them to Jesus. How I interrupted their suicide by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Went to their door. Went to streets and stopped them on the streets where they were going to jump off a bridge and commit suicide. And I found out they were homosexuals or lesbians. They had fallen into such despair in their life because of the way they grew up and the way they were abused and the way they were treated. But Jesus still loved them. And there's no law against love. Hallelujah. And I had many pastors say to me, man, you had me on the edge of the seat. I thought any second he's going to jump on the wrong side and say the wrong thing. And I got to turn it into the sheriff. <laughs> Never had to. I always told the pastors, go ahead and turn it into the sheriff, please. I'll take that recording all the way to the Supreme Court and we'll play it in every court room where I'm, I'm, my, my sentence is heard. They need to hear that there is a God that loves these people. <laughs> So that's my life. There's a CD or DVD out there that says how to commune with God. When I recorded that at Youth for Christ Studios in Kansas City, Kansas uh, City, Missouri, uh, studios there, uh, I was, I was uh, recording that. And while I was recording it, a young man, a homosexual come walking across the big parking lot there and heard my voice out in the parking lot and was going to jump off the bridge and commit suicide. And he stood in the door way out at the other end of that auditorium. I couldn't see him standing in front of all those doors out there, double doors. The auditorium was packed with people, big red curtain behind me and everything. I look terrible on this video. <laughs> I'm all in red. <laughs> I love the blood of Jesus, you know. But uh, I was telling about how 3 o'clock in the morning I had spoke at the, the, one of the first uh, national conventions of the new Full Gospel Businessmen. That's how recent it was, all right? Full Gospel Businessmen America. And T.D. Jakes had the, had the keynote speaking time. And so I, I spoke before it, and then he had that. He took it from there. And I was in my hotel. I had no more speaking engagement. And I was to go and be on a radio station at 6 o'clock the next morning over in Kansas City, Kansas. Follow, follow the sunflowers. Kansas State Road 5, and you'll get right to it. Yeah, uh-huh. So I just get to sleep at midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. The Holy Spirit wakes me up, says, get dressed. Pack your suitcase, you won't be back here. Go to the radio station. You ever talk to God like he doesn't know anything? <laughs> Come on, Lord. It's just one o'clock. <laughs> I got a lot of sleeping I can do. Well, when you were 29, Henry, you made a vow to me. Uh-oh, that was the second vow I made. <laughs> Lord, I'm tired of setting the alarm clock. I worked at an electronic industry over in Cedar Mill, Oregon at that time, and, and uh, my youngest son who's here wasn't born yet at that time. He was about to be born. He's here, I think. I don't see him, but he's back there. There he is. Hallelujah. Stand up, Hank and Heather. Come on. This is my youngest. This is the, the bottom of the line of number 13. Come on, Hank. Stand up. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, Heather. Come on. Oh, we got Carter. We got little Henry there. So we got Henry the fifth there. Hallelujah. And Henry the fourth. And I'm the third. Hallelujah. I'm just saying, let's just shut down the Henrys by the time we get to the seventh. Let's not go another eighth. <laughs> I've walked the land of Henry VIII. I could take you to his birthplace. I could take you all over Europe where Henry VIII affected everything from the Catholic Church to the Anglican Church founding it and the works. But uh, anyhow, uh, he was not quite born yet at that time. 
and I was working at this industry, and uh, I lived out in St. Helens, you know where St. Helens is, the other side of that Columbia River out there, and I would drive into Cedar Mill. We were helping with a church out in St. Helens along with my work, and uh, so I would get the children up at 4.30 in the morning and have devotions with them, lay hands on each of their heads, and give them to the Lord. That's the only way I could be free of 12 children, number 13 on the way. Hallelujah. And then I'd leave. I'd, I'd, I'd have my own time and breakfast and head for the company, be there by 6 in the morning. I was in management, so I like to be there early. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh boy, you never know what's going to go, you know, when you, when you do this. But um, I got to the place there at 29 years old that I, uh, I said, Lord, I'm tired of setting the alarm clock to have time with you in the morning. I was just plain tired anyhow because of the schedule I was keeping. Twelve children, number 13 on the way. It almost drove my wife into the Columbia River coming back from Longview on a India, Bombay, India ship working with the ship ministry and working with foreign nations before I went to foreign nations. See what I mean? God has a way of training you of the culture, the religion, and the language and all of the people. He was training me to go to the world. I had no idea at that time that I would be in any more nations than the, the three that I had been in, America, Mexico, and Canada. That's all. I just had three. I had no idea I would ever reach 50, but now we've reached 50. But uh, the training of God, and, uh, and I was tired, and so one morning I'm I'm walking the floor with my Bible, trying to have time with the Lord, and I'm so tired I'm falling asleep walking. I don't dare kneel because I'm going to fall asleep, and I'm embarrassed because I've promised the Lord this is my devotion time. And I realize I'm struggling to have time with the Lord. And I got upset, and I says, Lord, I'm tired. I guess you know that. Uh, I'm not going to set the alarm anymore to get up and have devotions. I make a covenant with you. If you want time with me, I want time with you. I give you permission that even if I've only had one hour of sleep, you can wake me up, and if I turn over and I'm still wide awake, I promise you I'll get up and give you that time until sleep comes back. That's the vow I made back then at 29. So now coming fast forward many years... Walking, praying nations, then I'm at this conference, and T.D. Jakes is ready to turn loose, you know, with wham, that booming voice of his. And, uh, and I'm gone to the hotel at midnight, and I get into bed at midnight. One o'clock, I'm awakened, and the Lord says, get up, get dressed, pack your suitcase. You won't be back to this hotel, and go to the radio station. Oh, come on. Lord, my map shows that it's less than seven miles to the radio station. You know, we, again, see, why do we talk to God like He doesn't know anything? We're talking to the all-knowing one. You know what I mean? I mean, He says, I knew you before you were born. I know when you sit down, when you stand. I even know your thoughts before you think them. David said, oh my word, look at the list that he wrote in Psalms. Even if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Oh my word, now that's pretty serious. I've never heard a testimony of anybody coming back from hell in bed. Have you? But it's in there. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a bed in hell or not. Some people love bed more than they do out walking around, so maybe their, their bed will be in hell. I hope not. But David wrote it, so it's there. All right? I don't like it. I don't like to talk about hell. But... Uh, I sleep for one hour. I'm wide awake. I can't go back to sleep. And the Lord says, get dressed, get going. I head out, come into construction on lovely Kansas 5. Detoured. Diverted into this heavy, heavy warehouse area with 
ten foot high rows of barbed wire on top and only a card gate to go in. And I'm lost. I'm wandering around. I've wasted an hour and a half trying to find Kansas 5. I can't find it. I'm frustrated. I can't even find my way out of that maze of warehouses there along the Missouri River. I am so frustrated. By 3.15 in the morning, I'm saying, Lord, come on. You didn't call me out of bed to get lost and lose sleep. I got to be... I got to be recording over at Youth for Christ Studios. Don't you know? And you know, you talk to God like he doesn't know anything. I don't think you do that. I do. I don't know why. And I said, Lord, help. Because I had stopped outside these fences, and these guys in these big warehouses are loading these diesel trucks, and they got pallet jacks, and they got their music going so loud on that on those platforms where they're loading, and they're yelling at one another, and I'm trying to yell above them, Help! They don't even hear me. Can you direct me out of here? Nobody hears me. They go on with their pallet jacks. They're, they're busy. I get back into my van. I'm frustrated, and I say, Okay, Lord, I know you didn't call me in here to get lost. What's going on? I need to get to, for some reason, to the radio station early. I don't know why. It's 3.15. Help. I drive one block, come to a stop sign, and I look to the left. For the first time, I see one of these all-night gas stations, you know, with the, the cans stacked up and the, the little sliding door office in the middle of pumps, and that's about it. And the lights are on. There's a human body there that will talk to me. Hallelujah. Lord, you answered my, my cry. Psalms 120, verse 1. In my distress. <laughs> that was a distress call. I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. You know, sometimes God will ignore you until you come to distress. Because you don't mean business enough. Maybe you're murmuring or complaining up to the distress call. I don't know. I don't know you. I know me. <laughs> but when that distress call comes from me, it gets an answer. But it takes a long time sometimes. I don't know. I guess the old saying is, I can handle this job all by myself. Is too strong in Henry Groover. Well, I think... Henry means ruler of the house. Uh, I don't want to be ruler of my house. I'd want to be leader of my house, but I don't want to rule him. I go up to this gas station. Here's the guy standing there in his little bitty cubicle, sliding door cubicle. And there's a young man with just a black vest on with tattoos all over him and a big medallion, a, a satanic medallion hanging on a chain around his neck, talking to the attendant. And I come driving up and roll my window down and say to him, excuse me, fellas, I need to know where this station is. And I named the station. And the station attendant says, is that that place where they talk about religion all the time? I said, yeah, that's it. Well, he says, it's just... You just go to the next stop sign, make a left, you'll come to Kansas 5, and then you go on it, and you just make a left, and you're two blocks down. If you, if you get out of your van and look, you can see the tower blinking up there. Oh, my word. I felt so stupid. Well, when he said, is this that place where they're preaching religion all the time? I says, yes. The man with the black vest and all and the tattoos and long black hair down to his waist says, man, I'm out of here. And away he goes. And as he's walking away, just probably no more than 100 feet, the attendant in that station says to me, can you give me one good reason to go on living? I said, I can give you a thousand good reasons, but the greatest reason of all is that Jesus Christ came into the world to give you life and give you more abundant life. 
And he said, I was just ready to blow my brains out when that young man walked up here and I didn't want anybody here. And he reached under the counter, pulled out a 38, and he said, I don't want to live anymore. Why do you say Jesus Christ came to give us life and give it more abundantly? I don't know that. I've never been raised with that kind of understanding. And I begin to share Jesus with him. He put the pistol down. And after a while, he began to weep, and he gave his heart to Jesus. He handed the pistol to me, and he said, I won't need this anymore. I hope I didn't hit some fisherman crossing the Missouri River in the head, <laughs> throwing it off as I crossed the river. <laughs> I never thought about that till later. <laughs> I didn't want that weapon of destruction, that weapon that had a covenant with death on it. I didn't want it in my van. I didn't want it with me. It's in the bottom of the Missouri River. But I had experienced that at 3.30 that morning, and I'm telling it there at Youth for Christ Studios, and the sound goes out in the parking lot, and this homosexual young man is walking across to jump off the bridge and commit suicide. He hears my testimony as I'm ministering. He stands in one of the double glass doors. And then I'm done ministering and this whole line of people line up for prayer. And I prayed over only three or four when the Holy Spirit said to me, get out that exit door and run to the front of the building as fast as you can. I said to my catchers, you pray for these people. I have another assignment. I darted out the exit door and ran as fast as I could go. As I got around that big auditorium, coming up to the first double door on the left, would have been on the left of me, the young man is stepping out the door. I run up to him and I say, you don't have to take your life. Jesus gave it for you to have life. He loves you. And he just melted down in tears. He told me later, I stood and listened to your testimony in the door and your preaching, how you hear from God and that there's a God that can hear and listen and cares. And if you call upon him, he'll answer. And he said, I stood in those double doors and I prayed for the first time in my life. And I said, if there is truly a God like that man says that can hear and if he can hear you, if you will send him to me to tell me that you love me, I won't go jump in the river and commit suicide. You see, he stood there. I'm, I've got a line of people to pray for. He says, oh, he's, he, didn't, he didn't hear this. And he told me I gave up and was heading out and going to go jump off into the river. And here I come running around the corner. Church... It is, it is so important for every single one of you that names the name of Jesus Christ to know the voice of the Lord. If you don't learn anything from what I say this morning or you out there that are watching this, if you don't learn anything of what I say this morning, just remember this. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and another's they will not hear. Think about that. You say, but I don't know the voice of the Lord. Then learn it. Learn it. My dad taught me and us boys, God speaks to his children. He gave you two ears and one mouth. When you talk to him, listen twice as much as you speak. He'll answer you. <laughs> By the age of 13, I had my first vision. No, I hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, but I had my first vision. <laughs> you don't have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to have a vision. I'm a testimony of that. It was a vision of my number three eldest brother, two brothers up above me, and how he wasn't serving the Lord and how the Lord was going to deal with him. Well, I waited till he got in at 2 o'clock that morning, and Mama had, 
pulled the chains on the cuckoo clock, and she went into her room to go to bed. Then I crawled across the hallway to my brother's room where he'd crawled into bed, and I crawled up beside his bed, and I said, Gerald, Jesus gave me a vision of you. Yes, little brother, what is it? And I told him the vision. He says, okay, you've delivered your soul. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. I got to get up and go to school in a few hours. I crawled back, got into bed thinking my mission failed. But he didn't listen to me. I thought he'd repent right on the spot. You know, without a vision, the people perish, right? <laughs> But I had delivered my soul. That's what he said to me. You've delivered your soul. Go back and go to sleep. I thought, well, he didn't repent. I don't know what to think. But I had a mama that right on the other side of my wall, she stayed kneeling and praying until the last one of us boys were in. She never got off her knees till the last child was in. Now, that's commitment. You'd have thought that all six boys would have been evangelists. I don't know why. One worked with NASA, and the other one worked with International Paper, the two oldest. That one that I was speaking to was up in Pied Piper House up on Cape Cod, running a guest house and forgetting Jesus. The next one joined the Jehovah's Witnesses. Does God answer prayer? You better believe he does. You keep praying for your children no matter what. Don't you ever give up. You raise them in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. The two, two so far that I've lost, three now, before they died, each one of them were calling on the name of the Lord. So I don't know what when they're old, they will not depart. I don't know when you're old. Only God knows because a thousand years is one day. One day says a thousand years. I'd say, what's 120? Moses got there. So can I. If the Lord tarries, my natural strength will not be abated. My eyes will not be dim. I can tell what time it is, and I don't like it. But uh, <laughs> that big red LED clock is glaring at me. When I worked at Motorola, we made the first LED clock. Yeah, it reminded me of working in, in the environmental science labs and research and development. <laughs> that first LED clock sold in the International Electronic Symposium for $50,000. It wasn't five years later, you could get them in a cereal box. Do you see why it's not so important to get the latest of electronic technology? Wait a couple years. You can get it for less than half price. I got Scottish blood. I'm no dummy. I also have patience. <laughs> Everybody lines up to get the latest. How ridiculous. You're paying top dollar for the latest? Wait a couple months. It'll drop 25%. Wait another year, it'll go 50%. Wait another year, and you'd probably buy it for pennies on the dollar. Technology's moving so fast, it's just obsolete by the time it comes off the production line. Well, where is that in the Bible? Knowledge shall increase. Is knowledge increasing? Are we in the last days? Where, where, when, where did technology go in the last 100 years, from 1917 to 2017? Huh? They were still horse and buggy, folks. There were steam engines. Where have we gone in the last, the last hundred years? Brother, this Bible has come alive in my lifetime. It, it, it's alive. It's alive. Hallelujah. These words are present tense. They're not archaic. They're not ancient. I know if you have a King James, you don't like King James language. Get over it. Read it. It's a lovely language. It's a romantic language. Amen? I know you got your RSV, ASV, all that. Oh, come on. Get rid of it. Get a King James. Get one authorized by the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I walked the land of King James Bible. 
where it was translated. I could take you right to the room. 1611 translation was done. I can take you to the first martyr, the stone, the memorial in England of the first martyr for the King James Bible. There's much martyr's blood on this translation. That's why it's so precious to me. Much blood on it. I could take you where King James, who authorized it, was standing down in Chepstow at this castle there. And he looked over at the bay there in the Chepstow where the, the D, River D flows into the, the Liverpool Bay there. And he saw his army being overcome. They were being conquered right before his eyes with a foreign invading force. It's written in a big brass plaque right there where I stood. And he fell on his knees right there. And he cried out and he said, Almighty God, under great persecution, I ordered your word to be translated and put into the hands of the people. Will you let our nation be destroyed for the righteousness that we have tried to perform? And the Lord spoke to King James and said, Stand on your feet and watch what I will do. Hallelujah. He stood on his feet, and all of a sudden, he writes there, it's written on that plaque, legions of white spirits begin to come down, angelic forces come down, joining his forces, and the invading forces, terror came over them, and they turned and fled back onto their ships, and that nation never come against England again. I like that. I like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. You know, there was a nation that was conquering Israel, and it was bad news for them, wasn't it? And the Lord tells his prophet, Elijah or Elisha, I get them mixed up. I don't know why they have to sound so similar. But uh, he tells his prophet, smite them with blindness. <laughs> Can you fight very good when you go blind? Oh, my word. I know about blindness. When I died in the automobile accident in 1984, I was blind when I come back into my body. Couldn't see a thing, couldn't feel a thing from here down. Couldn't even feel the blood running down my throat from the hole in my head. <laughs> he was three years old when that happened. Hallelujah. <laughs> Number 13. But when I heard that forest ranger's voice say, because they said, I heard a man and a woman say, he's breathing. I heard a man say, he's got pulse. I didn't know who they were talking about. They couldn't feel him checking my pulse. <laughs> I hear a man running. It's a forest ranger to get the ambulance out there. But I've been dead already with no vital signs for over 30 minutes. That's too dead. And he had called out, ambulance two days before over the mountain pass there in Northern California, and it was involved in a head-on collision. The driver of the ambulance was killed, and the person in the pickup truck that head on them was killed, and he didn't have the heart to call the ambulance out because he had called them for another previous accident, and two people were killed coming to the accident. Well, the one, the ambulance, head on into the pickup. That's what he told me later. And you had been dead a half an hour, so I didn't have the heart to call the ambulance out yet. You had just started breathing, and you just now had pulse. So that's why I said to the emergency radio, I wanted to get them on just in case if you kept breathing, it looked like you're going to live. <laughs> But he said, can you hold on that? When they said, shall we dispatch an ambulance? He said, can you hold on that? Now, here's the key words that I heard from that forest ranger's mouth. The woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. I thought, that's me. <laughs> there can't be any, any other woman with eight children in this accident. My wife was driving. I didn't get a census of who hit what. <laughs> but I knew that was me. Well, now, that was a voice I heard. But that was music to my ears to hear my wife and our eight children were okay. 
But we don't know about the man. I know about the man. I know about me. I know about my condition. I'm blind. I can't see. I can't feel a thing here. I think my eyes are bleeding. But the blood was running down my throat, and I was choking on my own blood. So what did I pray? Father in heaven, if my wife and my children are okay, I'm not going to the hospital. I don't care what's wrong with me. If my head is detached, you can put it back together. I'm going to my number two daughter's wedding down to Arizona. Hallelujah. I'm glad I made that decision. Praise God. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, okay, I'm going to heal you, but I'm going to put you through a little test first. <laughs> you know, sometimes healings have a, a severe testing. Like two red hot cutting torches that you cut steel with in each temple. Oh, <laughs> I thought the van was on fire. I was listening. Remember, I was blind. I expected to hear them say, the van's on fire. We've got to get him out. I didn't know I was out on the ground. And they're just saying, breathing's normal. Pulse is normal. Where's the fire? <laughs> it was in me. It started down. And it slowly went about this speed down me. But when it went down about right here, my vision began to come in, and this lady holding my face with both her hands, long brown hair, a white blouse, I can still see her so well, Mrs. Whitman of Whitman's Towing Service, Canby, Oregon. There's still Whitman's Towing Service, so if you don't believe my testimony. His wife was holding my face. Mr. Whitman was holding me down and holding a towel on my head where I had a hole where the corner bar of the car top carrier of 10 people's luggage came through the roof into my head. I had a lovely big hole. I know I stuck my thumb into it. I shouldn't be here. You see, I'm here because Jesus wants me here. You're here because he wants you here. Hallelujah. Somebody needed to hear this this morning. I, I, I haven't even got to the scripture I thought I was going to preach on, and it's already 1247. I don't know what we're going to do with it. <laughs> you see, when the fire hit right there, my vision came in, and the fire continued to go. Then I could feel, I could feel my tongue. I could feel the blood running down my throat. I began swallowing. And I said, Father, wherever that blood's coming from, you can stop it, and it stopped flowing. They had a towel on the hole in my head. And so when they tried to do CPR on me, the blood blew out of my hole in my head in their face. Two people gave up doing CPR. I don't blame them. They plugged the hole in my head. The next guy, the forest ranger, told me to try to do CPR on me. The blood blew out my nose into his face when he was blowing in my mouth. He says, man, I wasn't going to blow in your mouth anymore. I said, that's okay. I forgive you. He gave up. I lay there. <laughs> Our 15-year-old daughter, the oldest child with us on that trip, realized he's not coming back alive. Ran around to my wife, screaming. She grabbed her, thinking she was going into shock, praying over her. I don't know how long that took. I wasn't watching to watch. Nobody told me, but I was still dead, see? And when she began to relax, my wife let go of her. She ran back around the van pointed at my dead body laying on the ground and said, Devil, that's my daddy. You can't have him. I didn't know I belonged to the devil. <laughs> Death, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I asked her later, why did you say, Devil, you can't have him? I don't belong to the devil, honey. I've never belonged to the devil that I know of. She said, Dad, just a few nights ago I heard you preach. The devil in John 8 and 44 is a liar, a father of lies, a murderer, and a thief. So I figure he's the one that killed you. So I had to rebuke him. <laughs> you see your children, these, the little one here a while ago that squealed a little bit. I think that's Pastor Alvarez's son, right? All right, he's a preacher's kid. Just forgive him. It's all right. It's okay. Brother Alvarez is a preacher's kid. Look how he turned out. Just, just be patient with that little guy. He's going to be mightier than his daddy. Amen? Amen? He's going to be mightier than his daddy. Every generation is going to be greater in the Lord. Because why? We're destined for the glory of God to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. 
How much percentage of the earth is covered with water? 90%? Hey, that's pretty good knowledge of the glory of God. This is not going to go out in a blaze of reproach. We're going to go out in a blaze of glory or we're not going out at all. Hallelujah. This thing is going to end in such a blaze of glory that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth. It says cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Whoo! Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. I, I can't wait for it. Now I started several testimonies. Let's go back. All right. Let's just go back to last year after I was here and went up into Canada, was coming down. Ah, I had a lovely experience. I flew to, flew to Japan, do a dedication, came back, Canadian Air, back to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. We're circling in the airplane. You ever been in a holding pattern waiting for a, for a gate? All right, we're circling, we're circling, we're circling. No, I begin to realize this is not a gate problem. There's something else going on here. We're up here way too long. And I'm thinking about, okay, Lord, what's going on here? I know this is catching all of us by surprise, but it hasn't caught you by surprise. Why don't you just have that captain tell us what's going on so we know how to pray? Remember, you've got to pray specifically, don't you? Why do you, why do you pray specifically? You're getting mince meal this morning, just smorgasbord, peace here and a peace there. I'm just ministering to individuals that need this, all right? This is called personal ministry. Hang on. Don't get bored with me. Maybe I'll get to these scriptures. <laughs> Captain comes on. He says, well, he says, I guess you've noticed that I'm up here circling and circling by now. He said, we have a problem. The reason we came back up, it's not that our gate is not ready. Our landing gear won't go down. So they've been preparing the landing strip for foaming. We're going to do a belly landing. Now, people, you've got to listen to me. When I say, just before we touch down, I want you all leaning forward, holding your heads. Do not look up and look around, because sometimes when objects stop very quickly, objects go flying through the air, and you might just lose your head. So keep your heads down. Are you listening to me? I'm sure everybody's saying, <laughs> white knuckles everywhere. Oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I know this didn't catch my Lord by surprise. So I'm reminding my Lord, hey, wait a minute, Lord. Now I'm talking to him again like he doesn't know anything. I'm always doing this. It's my poor brain. It can't quit. Remember, it's Romans chapter 8, 7 through 9. It's, it's called the carnal mind. I'm not dead yet. My wife says, I'd love to find the switch to turn your, your mind off. I say, honey, when you find that switch, I will be dead. I will truly be dead. You can talk to me. You can do anything you want with me. I won't know it. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I said, Father in heaven, I know this didn't catch you by surprise, but it did me. Now, wait a minute. I prayed over every function of this plane, the hydraulic, the pneumatic, the electrical, the structural, every form of communication to from around it, every piece of luggage, every piece of cargo, every item on the, on the runway that could cause any damage, any item in the air of animal, bird, or human, or object of any kind. Lord, I covered everything. Now, why isn't that landing gear going down? And the Lord said to me, you forgot the mechanical. And I said, no, I didn't. Hydraulic, pneumatic, electrical, structural. Uh, oh. Oh. I did. In the name of Jesus, I command this mechanical problem to be corrected and the landing gear to go down. And I didn't realize I was sitting right above the wheel. I thought we landed. Kawam! The wheels go down. Now the captain said, now they're foaming the runway. We're heading for our landing. I could see out of the sides tops of buildings. So we're, we're close to landing. I thought we hit. 
No, the landing gear came down. He says, the tower has just confirmed our landing gear is down. He says, now, folks, I was not pushing any button, any switch to make the landing gear. I had pushed it, pushed it, pushed it, flipped it, flipped it, flipped it, and nothing would work. Now he says, hang on, you're not going to have to lean forward, I don't think. We may have a bit of foam flying when I reverse the engines. That's not clouds, that's foam. We're going to go on down. <laughs> and we made a beautiful landing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's what the people did when we came to a stop. Woo! We're stopped. <laughs> you see what I mean by it is so important. To know his voice. What if I wouldn't have known his voice? I'd have never heard him to say, you forgot the mechanical. I'd have gone on with mind, my mind probably repeating the same error over and over, forgetting the major thing, mechanical. Hallelujah. That's my God. That's the way he is. Now, I asked you a while ago, do you know the voice of God? And if you don't, how do you get to learn the voice? I just stopped with my daddy saying you got two ears and one mouth, right? Listen twice as much as you speak. All right. Here's how I began to learn the voice of God. I wanted to learn it more intensely by the time I was 20 years old. And so I made another covenant with the Lord. This is like the second covenant. The third one was when I was 29 about never setting the alarm. Wake me up, all right? I just remember that covenant. The Lord reminds me of covenants. He reminds. Remember, he, he remembers them. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I want to learn your voice so precise that you can give me book, chapter, verse that will be in perfect alignment subject-wise, when I believe you speak something to me that is a directive, something to do. I want to test it. So I, I never did it small. I said, Lord, I want six book chapter verses come to me from anywhere in the Bible. And if I'll I always carried a little pocket Bible. Can't read it now. It's too small. I still got it there. I saw it the other day at home. The cover's all worn out on it and everything. I used to read it. I mean, the fine print is so fine. You need a magnifying glass now to read it. I do. But uh, that's being, you know, by the time you're 39, you need glasses. You know that. So here I am. I begin to hear God's voice when... I'm asking, all right, I need the scriptures. And the scriptures begin coming to me. And I'm writing them down. And then I get my little Bible, and I get it out, and I start looking up the scriptures. Now, if the scriptures do not speak the same thing, I say, I'm not going to do it, Lord. I'm not being rebellious. I just am totally set on learning your voice accurately. It took me almost two years to hear precisely to where every book, chapter, verse was perfectly in line subject-wise. Now, that's a discipline. When I walked, when I was 24 years old, walked and prayed up in Toronto, Canada, I met a man by the name of Maxwell White. I don't know if you ever read the little classic book called The Power of the Blood by H.A.M. White. All right, some of you familiar with that. All right. I love that book that, that taught me the power of the blood of Jesus. We used to sing it all the time about the blood, the precious blood of Jesus. All your big evangelist meetings before miracles began, they would sing over and over about the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. And we'd sing it and sing it, and I cut my teeth on it. Well, so... God began to, to train me to hear his voice. Well, I met Maxwell White in Toronto, Canada, and he was a demon chaser. Boy, he went all over South America, down into, down into Africa, and he was a former, uh, the Royal Navy radio operator. And he fluently read and write and spoke uh, five languages. And so I sat beside him down in his basement on his ham set, 
and would listen to all of these voices coming through the headphones from all over the world, and all of a sudden he would stop, jot down the call letters of one of those voices, push the transmitter, and be talking back to them in their language. And I didn't even get the call letters. And that challenged me. It challenged me. Because all of these voices would come through. It was just a mesh of voices. I don't know if some of you aren't old enough. These old, tall, lovely wooden radios that have tuner gangs this big around. You could listen all over the world. If you tuned that, you'd hit certain points on that that so many voices would come in, you couldn't get one voice. That's kind of the way they were. Well, he was the same way with that. I said, Maxwell, how did you learn to focus in on one voice and listen to only one voice when there are so many voices coming through? He said, it's discipline. And you and I, to learn the voice of God, have to enter into that discipline. You have to shut all other things out. You sang about it this morning and totally focus on Jesus. Focus on the bridegroom because you're the bride. Hallelujah. Begin to learn the bridegroom's voice. If you love him enough, I guarantee you, you're going to learn his voice. I've never seen a couple yet fall in love and they didn't know each other's voice. Don't tell me they love each other. If when that one walks in the room and that person says something and they don't turn and a smile come on their face because the one they love just walked into the room. They knew it by their voice. And we've got to know that with our Savior. We must learn His voice. We are His sheep and the sheep of His pasture. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm so glad. Well, uh, I want to get into just a few minutes uh, in Genesis. Good place to begin. Chapter 1, even better place to begin. Where you and I came into existence. I want you to think about what you were seeing in the background of these words of this song, many, many of those songs. The heavens, you were seeing the glory of the heavens and the glory of the earth as the picture of the background of some of these songs. Uh, God had created a universe that you and I call the universe that was so awesome and so glorious, and it had everything set up in it just for you and I. It was made for us. God didn't need it. He spoke and the worlds were formed. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need those beautiful trees and all those cherries that they're harvesting across the land. He doesn't need all the strawberries and blueberries. You and I do. Hallelujah. I thank the Lord for the Northwest, and I miss the fruit of the Northwest. And I turn into a grizzly bear when I get here because I eat all the fruit I can get. I love it. It's delicious. Before I had my cereal this morning, I had a big bowl of blueberries <laughs> and raspberries and a banana. Hallelujah. Oh, boy, that was good. Mm, make my mouth water. I've got to be careful. I'll slobber in the microphone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then I had my cereal. <laughs> Can't have that in Iowa. Corn and soybeans. <laughs> you know, everywhere. Our little town of Woodbine is surrounded with corn and soybeans. That's it. That's it. Hardly any farms anymore with pigs and chickens and cows and horses. They're almost all gone. You can drive seven hours in Iowa, and on the right is corn or soybeans. On the left is corn or soybeans. Very few, very few uh, forests anymore. They've taken out most of the trees, and they've joined, as Micah says, field to field. And it makes God angry because you don't leave a place for the animals and the birds. You're in trouble. So we're always having to rebuke tornadoes in Iowa. Isn't that lovely? That's judgment. <laughs> I'm not under judgment. You're not under judgment. So you have been given something here. And that's what this verse 26 says. And God said, let us make man. Hallelujah. Praise God. Aren't you glad he said that? You wouldn't be here if he hadn't have said that. And let us make him in our own image, our own image, in our own likeness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at each other and say, you're made in the likeness and the image of Almighty God. 
Look at that person beside you and say, you are beautifully made in the likeness and the image of God. You are beautiful. You are the beautiful handiwork of Almighty God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love it. Took me four days to teach that down in Malaysia. Oh, I love you with the love of the Lord. You know that song? I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King. And so I got them singing it in English. I taught it in English. They predominantly speak Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. Had them singing it. They learned it. And then the Lord says, now have them look at each other and sing it. You know how they'd look at each other? Close your eyes tight. I love you with the love of the Lord. I said, open your eyes. Asian people, they don't show affection publicly. Took me three days to get them to begin to look at each other. How did I get them to do it? The Lord said, get off the platform. There was over 3,000 people there. And he said, walk and sing to them right in front of them till they'll look to the right and left and open their eyes and sing it. I sang four and a half hours up and down the rows until I would stay in front of them till they would keep their eyes open. And when they'd keep their eyes open and be able to look at each other and sing, the tears would start flowing. And behind me, as I made my way through those 3,000, some people, the Spirit of God began to melt hearts and people began to love on one another. And we, were, we introduced a love fest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One lady just... Just... Wanted me to know, I'm, no, this is blocking you. I'm not singing. I didn't know who she was, but the Lord said, just keep singing. Just keep singing, keep singing. And I don't know how long I sang. Again, I didn't look at the watch. I didn't even know I sang four and a half hours. I knew I was tired. I knew it was hot. I knew my suit was soaked. It was so hot and humid. And she's just, next thing I know, she goes, Love you. I, 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 I love you. And she's looking up at me and the tears are flowing. With the love of the Lord. And then I go, I, 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 love, I love you with the love of the Lord. Now look at the other way. I love, and I went on down the line, and boy, that broke it. The dam broke. I just look at them, and they just start singing and looking to the right and the left. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I finished, headed out the doors, went to my hotel, put on another suit, get a cold shower, come back for dinner. The evening session should begin. That started the 2 o'clock session. Well, sorry. We went past 7 o'clock. I hadn't even looked at the clock. Singing, I love you. Come back with a dry suit and all, and a love feast is going on. I look up on the stage, and the, the, the director of the conference is sitting up there, his face in his hands, and he looks like he's sobbing. And I go through a side door to get back up like they'd always led me in. I couldn't get through the people. I'd never got to him. I get up to him, and I sit down beside him, put my arm around him. And I said, Brother, are you okay? And he looks at me. He says, Yes, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. I says, well, why are you crying? He says, where, are we, where have you been? I said, I ran down to the hotel to get dry clothes on, get, get cooled off. I was so hot. The anointing makes you hot too, see? So in Malaysia, you're doubly hot. Whew, I was soaked. And he says, then you weren't here. And I says, no, I just got in and come along up here. He says, that lady that you just kept singing in front of, do you know who she was? I says, no, I don't know who she was. He said, that was my mother. She's one of the main leaders of the Buddhist movement of Malaysia. I called her all three days. This day is the last day. I called her this morning again, four days, begging her to come because she's learning Western English. And you speak Western English very well. And I told her, you're paying a lot of money to learn Western English. You can get a whole day of Western English free of charge. If you don't want to give anything, you don't have to. <laughs> 
And finally that morning she says, all right, I will come on this condition and only one. And I thought, oh boy, what was that? Here's this covenant thing, see. You know I am Buddhist. And you know I'm a leader in Malaysia in the Buddhist movement. Now you must make a covenant with me. I will go, but that you will never ask me to another Christian meeting again. And he says, oh boy, I had a decision to make. And I quickly, quietly cried out, Lord, is this a good deal? <laughs> See, that's in all your ways. Acknowledge the Lord and he'll direct you, right? And he said, peace come over me. And you've been teaching about peace. And I thought, okay, this must be the voice of God. And so I said, okay, Mom, I make that covenant with you. And she said, all right. She said, I'm bringing 30 of the top Buddhist people. And we're going to show you who God is today. He said, you were singing to her. And all of those 30 were beside her. And when she broke, they broke. He says, I was bawling up here watching this. I said, hallelujah, where are they? He said, they just left the stage. That's what the people are rejoicing. I led all 31 of them to Jesus in front of the whole congregation. I said, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You're awesome. You see, there are many ways to do missionary work in foreign countries. Some of it is sing. Just sing, 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 sing. Hallelujah. Bring them in. You know what I mean. Bring them in by singing. Only the Lord knows. But that's the beauty of the Lord. I love to see how God works. I'm believing Brother Alvarez over there in Siberia or wherever he is. I'm believing God is just doing an awesome work to him. In him, through him, and to the people. I've had my works up in Siberia. I could, I could testify till this time tomorrow what God is, has done in Siberia. I got up on the Arctic Ocean. Way up there, I wanted to go where nobody goes. Oh, my word. Nobody goes. Just reindeer shepherds up there in the military and the icebreaker. I got on the icebreaker called the Murmansk. State-of-the-art icebreaker. Guns on it, helicopter on it, and everything. Beautiful icebreaking ship. It comes breaking up ice, comes up to port. Down comes the radio operator standing there with his two-way radio, first person off the gangplank. I've been going on ships in Portland, Vancouver, Kalama, all the way through to Astoria for years. I'm, I'm experienced in this. So I asked the radio operator, permission to board. And he says, you're American. I said, yes. He said, this is a military ship. Why would you ask to board a Russian military ship? And I said, because I have Bibles I want to give them Bibles about God. He gets on the two go talking in Russian. I didn't know what he was saying. Next thing I know, here comes a man down the gangplank. It's the captain. And he says, why? Why do you want to get on my ship? I said, to give out Bibles free. He says, my men for three months have been going up on the ice, breaking the ice, going back, breaking ice. I'm giving them a four-hour leave. That's the first leave in three months. And you want to come and detain my men that are preparing to leave this boat? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Would you like the first Bible? <laughs> in Russian. Now, to be an officer, he had to speak English. You realize that. Ships, airlines. To be an officer, I don't care what country you're in, to be a captain, you've got to fluently read, write, and speak English. English is the international language. These ships that come in here, they all, all the officers, to be an officer, have to speak and read and write English. That's the beauty of it. You see the gospel that can be preached to these people right here in your ports? We work to 70 countries of the earth right here in the ports. He said, I will give you 15 minutes, no more. I said, thank you, sir. How many Bibles you have? I has a whole bag. How many men you have? 45. I said, I got more than that. I can give them more. They can take home. Come with me. Up the gangplank we go. Gets on the intercom. 
calls all the men preparing to go off on leave duty. Here they are, puts them in attention. They're all sitting there. Share Jesus Christ with them and the love of Jesus Christ. Many of them had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I said, now, I have free books about God. How many want them? Every hand, everybody wanted one. I give them all the books, and I, I, I'm looking at them, holding these little Bibles. They start to read them, and they're just hugging them. They forgot about getting off of that ship. They're just looking and reading and hugging. Hallelujah. See, there are places you can be called to by the Lord to go. And just don't limit him. Don't limit him. I can't walk out on the frozen Arctic Ocean, but he can bring the icebreaker to me. Hallelujah. I love it. When you go where God wants you to go, you go in his timing and in his way, he always opens doors that no man can open and he shuts the doors you don't need to go into. Never fight against opening a door. Let God open them. Let him shut them. Don't strive to open a door. Walk in the peace of God. And then you have just received the lovely thing called the axe. No, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you, that's you. Anybody here that isn't you? Look at each other and say you. Yeah, you're all you. You shall receive power when? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you got that dynamite power. That means dynamite or explosive power to be a witness. It means you get to see God do it. I love that. I love to watch my God do things. I ask him, set me up. Things have been too quiet. Haven't had any good faith challenges lately. Put me where I can't get out. Put me in over my head where I'm down for the third time. And if I go the fourth, I'm dead. Put me in, in a totally impossible situation, Lord. And I'll rejoice in you because I'll get to see you get me out of it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And he does. You know me. I've been told so many times, you're going to die, man. Too late. I'm already dead. Oh, oh, already dead. Colossians 3.3. 3. For you are dead. Oh, that doesn't talk about your, your life. Well, the next word's in the King James. That's why I like the King James. And it says, and your life. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? If you lose your life, are you dead? You are dead and your life is hidden with God in Christ Jesus. It means it's in the safe of heaven and only God knows the combination. <laughs> And the only way you can get it back, if God determines it's time to bring you home, go ahead and let him kill you. It's all right. It's time to go home. Paul said to die is gain. That's the second death. First death is giving your heart to the Lord. <laughs> because to be dead, to die is to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. You were singing about it. You were, you were singing a love song to him a while ago. Were you loving on him? You're singing about the bride and the bridegroom. Boy, I, when we talked about the coming before him as the king and all that, I have to bow. I, I, can't, I can't just stand straight uh, when, when you start singing about coming before the king. Hey, I, I've walked in royalty company. I've, I've, I've dined with some members of the royal family. I've, I've dined with the house of lords. And I want to tell you what, you bow. I've, <laughs> well... Spent five days with the leaders of China. Gave two speeches before the, the leaders of China. Received a standing ocean, ovation, you know. Led one of the leaders of China to Jesus right on the Great Wall. Uh, just last year, had the honor of being with the number one Buddhist priest of all of Japan. Hallelujah. Been praying over, over Buddhist temples since 1995. And witnessing to Buddhist priests and Shinto, Shinto uh, priests, they call them priests as well, and then shaman, high priestesses, Utahs and Neros. Uh, women are high priests down through the, the Pacific run. Men are predominantly voodoo high priests down through the Atlantic. I don't know if you realize that. Uh, 
realize that. And your voodoo priests, a lot of them, the highest ones are men, down through the Atlantic all the way into Africa. But the women all the way down through Asia in, in witchcraft are the high priests. You have the women and the men. See, the devil has his bride and bridegroom. He's, he's a copycat. He can't do anything except he tries to copy what God does, and he makes a mess of it. And you and I have to come along and straighten it out. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. No. Wait a minute. I read that wrong. I thought it was 1204. It's 120, 53, 4, 5. Where did the time go? I told him I had to be done by 1.30. It's 1.21. <laughs> I only read one verse. And I didn't even get all of it read. God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. Hallelujah. And he names every living thing, every object right there. Verse 27, 28, he does the same thing. He repeats himself. Let them have dominion. You and I have dominion. It's time to take dominion. It's time to face whatever makes you fear. It's time to release the power of that dominion. When you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit was born again. You now have inside of you the living spirit of Almighty God. You have been redeemed back through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the cross. Hallelujah. You have now been brought into the power of the fullness of these words that God said. Now, I know the very next chapter, uh, it just takes chapter 2, and by chapter 3, uh, the beast appears. Oh, boy. When he appears, he messes everything up. Isn't chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 terrible? Oh, Lord. Made a mess. And poor Adam, he was in such love with Miss Universe. She was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. Right? The only one. She would have won Miss Universe easy. He couldn't say no to her. I don't blame him. Come on. Every one of you guys here that are married, you married a beauty queen. You married the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. Do you realize that? Look at your wife and say, you're the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. You're Miss Universe. Hallelujah. Doesn't that make you feel good, guys? Doesn't that make you feel good there, ladies? Say that more often to your wife. Why? Why? Because wedged right in the middle, middle of Ephesians chapter 5, where he's talking about how you're to conduct yourself as married people, he just takes that little verse 27, and he introduces the bride, the glorious church, without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. Hallelujah. You were singing about shining. We've got to start shining. And you've got to start shining with your love. You've got to start shining in your love for each other in the natural because that's first 15, first Corinthians 15, 46. He spends about 44 verses, 45 verses, talking about all kinds of things from the celestial to the terrestrial, doesn't he? And then all of a sudden in verse 46, he's still on subject, but he uses the word however. Now, most translations eliminate that, but King James leaves it there. I'm glad it's there. Because he says, however, like, you better take note of what I'm going to say. That which was first is not spiritual, but that which is natural, afterward that which is spiritual. That's why Ephesians chapter 5 is talking about the natural. You and your bride, you and the one that you have covenanted with. You are a type of Jesus Christ who has covenanted with you, his bride. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then it goes on talking about husbands and wives in verse 7, 47. Ephesians 5, 27. 
1 Corinthians 15, 46. That which first was not spiritual, but that which is natural. You that are here representing Israel and love Israel, you keep your eyes on Israel. Why? Because what goes on over there in Israel, in the natural, is going to happen in the church, in the spiritual. Israel sets the timetable in the natural. If you don't believe it, there's a little book out there called The Rebirth of Judah versus The Church Glorious. It, it shows you in the scriptures and in archaeology and history uh, how Israel must come into its glory, the natural. Why? Because when Israel comes into its glory, Zechariah chapter 12, Hosea chapter 5, when Israel comes into its glory, when is it going to come into its glory? When it recognizes they crucified their Messiah. Verse 10, and they mourn and weep the rest of chapter 10, 12. Of, of, I'm hurrying and i got to slow down. Zechariah 12, verse 10, they recognize that they crucified their Messiah. And it says they go into mourning the rest of chapter 12 and all of chapter 13. When does Jesus come back and set foot on the Mount of Olives? Not till chapter 14. You see, Israel must come into its place and go into mourning, national mourning, recognizing that they have crucified their Messiah. Then the verses that say, the feeblest of them will be as David in that day. And the governors of Judah shall go forth. Judah, what we call Israel is predominantly Judah geographically. The governors of Judah shall be like a fire upon the hearth. And they shall go forth and utterly destroy on the right hand and on the left. Charisma magazine, uh, one of their main writers got a hold of that little book and called me up. I spent four hours on, on the phone with her explaining the rebirth of Judah and all so she could write an article in Charisma. And the agreement was then they would advertise the book. That would be my payment. Well, it sounded good, four hours on the phone explaining everything. But when the article she wrote and they checked out my rebirth of Judah, uh, that she editor-in-chief read it, he says, uh-oh, there's only one little clause here that I cannot accept. It's too dangerous. It's too volatile. That Zechariah chapter 12 where it says the government shall be like a fire on a hearth and they shall go forth and utterly destroy on the right hand and on the left. They're going to purge Israel of the Palestinian problem. It's going to happen, people. It has to happen. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that is not of the Hebrews, of the people that is of Hamas or the Palestinians that will not join Israel will be destroyed. It's going to be an ethnic cleansing of Israel people. I didn't write it. It's in there. But he kicked it out. He said, no, no, that's too volatile. He could have just changed that one verse, but he didn't want to promote the book for that reason. It's too volatile. Yeah, that's the same reason CNN, MSNBC, and ABC, and CBS are all scared to death of Islam. I love the Muslim people. I witnessed to them. I led 12 of them to Jesus flying from, from uh, Constantinople, Turkey, you know, to New York. They were all around me. When you're surrounded by Muslims, it's time to shine. Shine. They, can, they, they put out silverware then. They could have stabbed me with the knives. I could have been dead by the time we got to New York. No, wound up getting their addresses. We sent all of them Bibles. Hallelujah. They all came to Jesus. We had a prayer meeting on that jumbo jet. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And it all started with a simple thing of what I talked a while ago. I turned to the one, the Muslim guy to the right of me and the Muslim guy to the left of me. And I said, excuse me, would you mind agreeing with me in a word of prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ for a safe flight? They believe in Jesus Christ. The Quran calls Jesus a great priest, not the Son of God. 
I pray, claim the covering over the plane like I mentioned a while ago. Now, they're asking questions. They're on their knees when we get in the air. The, the seatbelt sign goes off. They're on their knees, two rows in front of me. I've got a congregation. They want to know all about Jesus. They'd never heard about Jesus. They never thought about asking Jesus to protect them in a flight. Why do you do this? Why do you call him the Lord Jesus Christ? Why not just prophet? Taught me about the Quran. I taught them about the Bible. By the time we got to New York, all of them around me had given their hearts to Jesus, gave me their addresses so we could send them Bibles. Hallelujah. They need Jesus. Minister to the Muslim people around here. Well, it's now 1.30, and I said I needed to be done by 1.30. Ah. Uh, in closing, we know the mess that was done from chapter 1, verse 26, 27, and 28, don't we? We know the mess that happened when the fall took place. We know how bad it went all the way to Genesis chapter 6, don't we? Because that was the great flood, right? And then 7 and 8, we know all about that the waters decreased off the earth. And then Noah came out of the boat and he did a sacrifice. We know all about that. That's all of chapter 8. Let's jump all the way forward to just verse 1 and 2 of chapter 9 and I'll close. All right? Is that fair? You can go get lunch. Not yet when I close. Hallelujah. All right. Chapter 9. Look at what he says here. And God blessed Noah and his sons, said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. All right, that's good. But look at verse 2. I hope your translation says it this way. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. That's King James. Did you hear that? The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. I've been testing this with dogs, wild animals, snakes, fish, because I have dominion. Polar bears, grizzly bears. I've walked in all of their countries. I, I walk among them. And I've not been eaten yet. I have no claw marks. The only claw marks I have is from, well, a lady that was of alternative lifestyle that clawed at me. She wound up crying and repenting. I forgave her. <laughs> she needed Jesus, that's all. I just forgave her and said, you need Jesus. I understand your anger. I understand your hatred. But you see, this tells another facet there in verse 2 of chapter 9. The fear and the dread of you shall be upon every beast. Now let's fast forward to the book of Revelation. Where does the beast appear again with the woman in Revelation? It's called the beast, his image and the number of his name. Church, bride, woman, you're going to face the beast again. But this next time, you're not going to be like Adam and Eve. You're not going to fail because your bridegroom is going to be with you every moment. You're the bride. You're not going to be deceived by the beast, his image, and the number of his name this time. You're going to overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. So start stocking up testimonies now. Get a whole lot of testimonies because the more things, the darker things get, the more testimonies you're going to have. And the greater you can shine the light of Jesus Christ. God bless you. I'm, I'm going to quit. I just better quit. Uh, can't say everything. There are schedules out there where I'll be, by the coffee bar up on the top there. There are material catalogs there, tells you what they're about. If you're interested, I can't share all of 55 years in one hour. Uh, there's the explanation, the number of it. The materials are, are literally from left toward right in the order of what this is. So if you're looking for a particular subject, Starts with angelic praise on the left, going down, going down, going down to DVDs. Don't grab a DVD and try to play it in a CD way. They don't work in CD players, okay? We get people sending them back saying it didn't work. Well, what did you put it in? Well, my CD player. It's a DVD. 
DVDs don't play CDs. DVDs don't play in CD players, and CD players will not show you anything in a DVD player. There are rules. You must abide by them. I love you. I, Brother Alvarez, if you're watching, thank you for letting me come again with your congregation. I love them. They're wonderful people. I love the worship. I love the praise. And uh, I just, I, I make an apology for that red clock over there. It went way too fast. Father in heaven, I just ask that you just seal in every person's heart, those that are on, li on the line and those that are sitting here, Lord. I know I covered a, a smorgasbord of things here, but Lord, I ask that you just seal it in each heart, that it brings forth fruit after its kind, that above all, that they learn your voice if they don't know your voice, that they learn your voice because, Lord, then they'll fall in love with you more than ever before. Bless this congregation. Bless those that have come today from all over. Bless those that are listening in. Be with them. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.